So hello, welcome to the last day of new material. Uh, general idea today being the ninth. Uh, tomorrow at one o'clock is an optional review, which I will record and post online after. And Friday will be practice problems, like always. And that is the last class. Um, don't forget you have a homework due tonight on chapter 30. I always mess up the numbers in physics too, since they'll Yep, chapter 30 homework is due tonight. Chapter 31 homework is due the 13th. And your final is the 14th at 5.30 p.m. Um, at the end of today's class, I'm gonna talk a bit more about the final, if, as long as I have time. If I don't, I should have time. There's actually, despite this saying only halfway through the PowerPoint, I'm much closer than that because it's the way I made the slides. Um, we were talking about oh, the model of the atom though. And we talked about Bohr's model of the atom, which said, which predicted the existence of energy levels and kind of proved the existence of energy levels, I should say. And then we said that the Schrodinger model of the atom came after, which said that, you know what? Electrons, they're waves. Let's keep them as a wave function and the probability of the location of an electron. An interesting thing came out of the Schrodinger equation though, which is where I'm gonna pick up is that when you solve the Schrodinger equation for hydrogen, some bits fell in that didn't at first make sense. And Schrodinger, what his theory was, was the energy levels that Bohr found had subbands, that each energy level could be broken into sub-energy levels. And that like the first energy level wasn't just one energy level. Actually, that one was, but that's another story. But higher energy levels weren't just one thing. It was a bunch of smaller energy levels right next to each other. And that when the Schrodinger equation was solved, it was figured out that each energy state or energy level has substates. And he, well, eventually we decreed three substates. Uh, they weren't all done by Schrodinger. Some came longer with time. And these substates are the orbital quantum number, which is normally represented by the letter L, the orbital magnetic quantum number, which is M sub L, and the spin magnetic quantum number, which is M sub S. The general idea and why these have magnet into them is that uh, the emission spectra we saw, that when we excited the gas and saw the emission spectra, it was realized that if you excited the gas in a magnetic field, that each of these spectral lines got split into other lines. This is known as Zeeman splitting. And the realization was that these energy levels could be pulled apart with magnetic fields. Hence that they're all based off, mag all but one is based off the mag mag magnetivity, good words, based off the magnetic field ideas. Um, what these mean, what they are is a little complicated. It gets into some pretty high math. I'm not gonna get into all of that. Um, the first one I'm really good, only one I'm gonna really talk about though is this uh, spin one, at least the first I'm going to talk to. Uh, spin was not predicted by Schrodinger. That came a little bit later. And by a little bit, I wanna say like within five years. Uh, when was the Schrodinger equation? Nope, one year, one year later. Um, the MS, the electron spin, also known as, I put it here, I put it here as spin magnetic quantum number. It's sometimes just called electron spin. Um, was found by Paul Dirac in 1927. And this one's kind of interesting because this is the most hand wavy thing we are ever gonna cover in this class. Electron spin only has two possible values plus one half or down one half. And it's sometimes referred to as spin up or spin down. And here's the logic. Let's say, let's say I have the ideal gas law within there. You can ignore the ideal gas law. Let's say this is my electron. I can say the electron spins clockwise. I could say the electron spins counterclockwise. And if we do the right hand rule, we're going to decree clockwise as, in, as down. And if it's going counterclockwise, right hand rule, we're going to say that's up. And spin down and spin up just represents is it spinning clockwise, which is spin down, or counterclockwise, which is spin up. 
And because the electron is a charged particle, the process of it spinning in a circle is going to be that the electric field is shifting because it's a charged particle changing. And that, that's what causes the magnetic field that is electron spin, that the electron spin is from this spinning. Now, you might remember I covered this idea of electron spin when we first introduced magnets, that the spin, whether we spin down or spin up, is what causes magnetic fields. Here's the thing, though. The electron isn't spinning. The electron's a wave. It's not a particle. We can't talk about how an electron is spinning. That just isn't what's happening. Here's the thing. Here's the other thing, though. If you say, if you acknowledge, you know what, the electron isn't actually spinning, it's a wave, but let's say it's spinning, the math all works. And so scientists always refer to spin up and spin down as spinning clockwise or counterclockwise because the math works perfectly if that is what was happening, even though it's not. And we still call it spin, but that's not what it's really doing. But once again, the electron spin is also what causes magnetic fields as we covered in chapter, I want to say full, I think it was full. Oh, this class, the fourth chapter. So chapter 23. Any questions on that? Now, each of these um, quantum numbers have limitations to what is allowed, whether it be the N, L, M sub L, or M sub S. And I already said M sub S. Um, M sub S could be a half or one half. Sorry, one half or negative one half. That's all the possibilities. For the other ones, the restrictions are as follows. N can be any positive integer, just like in the Bohr model. That it could, N equals one is the ground state for hydrogen, but then you have N equals two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. L can be any value between zero and n minus one, which means in the first energy level, n equals zero. In the second energy level, n can be zero or one. In the third energy level, it could be zero, one, or two. In the fourth, it could be zero, one, two, three. And so for any energy level, you will have a number of orbital quantum numbers equal to whatever the energy level was. And it's not just like, and all of those states are allowed. All of those subbands will exist. And the electrons will fill these various subbands. Now, M sub L can be any value from negative L to L, including zero. And when I say negative L to L, I mean, let's say we're in a orbital quantum number that is at two. If it's at two, it could be negative two, negative one, zero, one, or two. If L equals zero, it can only be zero. If L is one, it could be negative one, zero, or one, and so on. And so these various pieces will show what quantum numbers are allowed. Well, once again, M of S can just be a half or negative one half. And we can, if we put this if we use this idea, we can talk about exactly how electrons interact and exactly how electrons in an atom, where they will be and where they will be will have a lot dealing with what, how they will act. All of chemistry and this guy with the periodic table is all based off these subbands, where they are and what they're doing. So let me give you an example. Let's say I have an electron and I say it's in the first energy level. That will be the cell, the shell. If it's in the first energy level, its shell will be n equals one. Now, for the first energy shell level, there is only, we can talk about what the values for L, M of L, and M of S can be. Now, L is everything from zero to n minus one, but n minus one in this case is one minus one is zero. The only Subshell that's allowed will be the L equals zero subshell because there's no other ones allowed. M of L can be everything from negative L to L, but it's zero. So the only value allowed for M of L will also be zero. 
where spin can be a half, a negative one half. And this is why it works really, everything works real well for nitrogen and why everyone can solve for nitrogen. Nitrogen is nice and simple. There's one value of N, there's one value of L, there's one value of M of L, and there's two for spin. This also, for those of you taking chemistry, you might know the whole thing that everyone wants to complete an octet except for hydrogen and helium. This is why. Now, we will write this. What it is, is this can hold two electrons. One electron will be an N equals one, L equals zero, M of L equals zero, MS equals a half. And the other one will be an N equals one, L equals zero, M of L equals zero, M of S equals positive one half. I might have said positive one half twice, but one should be positive, one should be negative. And we can write the location of an electron just by putting all these numbers in parentheses, by writing N comma L comma M of L comma M of S. And so the location of these electrons will be respectively one, zero, zero, negative one half and one, zero, zero, positive one half. But let's stay instead. Let's say instead that we have something in the second energy level, that is a shell is n equals two. Well, if it shows n equals two, there's diff two different L values allowed. L minus one is one, and it can be anything between that and zero, which means L could be one or zero, and its sub, sub shell will be those values. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna view each one differently. First, I'm gonna look at my L equals one. M sub L is everything from L or negative L to zero. So that means for the L equals one term, I can have M of L equals one, M of L equals zero, and M of L equals negative one. Meanwhile, for my L equals zero, L, M of L has to be zero. But for every one of these, I can have spin one half or negative one half. So I got a negative half or half, negative half or half, negative, all right, they all popped up at once. I just throw it once and say repeat down. And so for n equals two, we have eight possible substates. Well, I'm just going through and reading these. Two, one, one, negative one half, two, one, one, half, two, one, zero, negative half, two, one, zero, half, and so on. And this will say, if you have an electron in n equals two, it could be in any of these eight states. Um, this is getting ahead of myself in a thing I don't think I'm even ever going to cover in this class. But for those of you who are taking chemistry, I'm going to state that now. The fact that n equals 2 um, can hold eight states is very important. This is something called the octet rule. This is the basis of all chemical bonds and chemical reactions. Uh, the eight comes really fancy and not even higher states, mostly because um, the way energy shells fill, which I will talk about in this class. But in general, the states and substate, or the state really, the shells and the subshells, but the state of any electron in any atom can be specified by its full quantum numbers, N, L, M of L, M of S. And to go one step further, a man named, blanking on his first name, he, that one pic, that one slide where I had a pictures of everyone and put them up, he was there. I think it's Wolfgang. I want to say it's Wolfgang, but Polly. But a man whose last name was Polly, blanking on first name, actually he wrote something called the Polly's exclusion principle. And he says, no two electrons in an atom can ever have the same set of values of quantum numbers. It's actually a little more complicated than that. It's that no two Fermi particles can have the same quantum numbers. There's a different type of particle that can do this. That gets into some very high level physics. But that's the idea, that in any atom, every single electron must have different quantum numbers. I mean, parts of it can be the same, but the total thing has to be different. That's its location. That's where that one is. No one else can be there. And what they worked out is that the ground state for hydrogen, we know it's n equals one, 
L equals zero, M of L equals zero, M of S is a half or negative one half. But what they realize is that each one can only hold so many electrons. It, going back to real fast to my L equals zero, L equals zero has only two possible states. That means my first shell, my n equals one shell, can only hold two electrons. My n equals two has eight shape states. That means it can only hold eight electrons. That's as many as it can hold. And if you add any more electrons, what's going to happen if you try to add more electrons than that is you'll go to a new shell. That if you max out n equals one or n equals zero, no, I misspoke. If you max out n equals one and max out n equals two, you add any more electrons, it'll just go to n equals three. Because n equals three is a whole other state that can hold electrons. And that's the general idea. The order that electrons fill an atom subshell is they put as many as they can in the lowest energy. Normally for the n equals one, go fill that, then go to n equals two, then fill that, then go to n equals three, then fill that. And if something is filled, we go to the next subshell. And a subshell is filled when it holds two times two L plus one, sorry, two times two L plus one electrons. Question or? So when it makes a new, like when you goes to the next N level, mm -hmm. does that, does it get like a weaker hold on it? Or is it, it the does. same? It does, yes. Because uh, it goes to a higher N, that also means a further out radius. A further out radius means the electron is further away from the nucleus. Further away from the nucleus means Coulomb force is less. So yes, the bigger it is, the less the hold is, is there. And so when we were doing, like, so last chapter when we were working with uh, the electron volts, like what it takes to get one electron to leave a particular um, element? Yep. Is it based off what shell it's in? It is highly related to that. It's also some other bits going in, but that is part of it. Because I was wondering how does that relate with like, with like when we work with semiconductors and you dope a material? <laughs> Semi, okay. So if we just do metals, Electrons are kind of loot, let free in metals, the way metal bond works. If the electrons aren't held to any particular atom, they just move freely throughout it. When you get into semiconductors, how electrons move within the material, that's its own course. I'm not going to lie. Like, that is its own thing. But the electrons can move freely to an extent, but are kind of held in place. And depending on how you dope the material, you can change how freely the electrons can move. Um, that's less the subshell and more the location of them. Gotcha. Okay. Now, this note says for ease, I personally think to drive people fucking crazy, each L state is actually normally referred to by a letter. That each one stands for something, I doubt I can remember what they stand for off the top of my head. And that if someone's in the L equals zero subshell or the L equals one subshell, the L equals two or the L equals three subshell, no one calls them zero, one, two, or three. Personally, I think that would be easier because math, but everyone instead refers to them by number or by letter. If you're in the subshell at L equals zero, that is known as the S shell. Well, S, I'm pretty want to say S stands for shelf. If L equals one, that is in the P cell. P shell. Well, I might have it written down somewhere. I think it's sharp, principal, diffuse, and I forget after that. Like, I literally don't remember the names. But if L equals 1, you're in the P shell. And so you don't normally say L equals 1, you just say it's P. If L equals 2, that is known as the D shell. And if L equals 3, it is known as the F shell. And at that point, it just goes off alphabetically. I want to say it's sharp, principal, diffuse, fundamental. But as I said, that might be wrong. I don't expect you to know that. After it hits F, it literally is, then they just go G, A, A B, like A, B, C, D, E, F. Screw it. Let's just keep going. G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. So they don't mean anything anymore. Now, each shell can hold a set number of electrons. In an S shell, 
L equals zero, two electrons are allowed, as we covered before. In a P shell, L equals one. So M of L could be negative one, zero, or one, but there's two different spins, so six electrons are allowed. In a D shell, L equals two. So M of L could be negative two, negative one, zero, one, or two, but there's spin, so 10 electrons are allowed. An F shell can hold, um, I like how I just wrote electrons involved instead of allowed. And I didn't say the number. I want to add that real fast. It can hold 14 electrons. Oh, you know, I bet you I know why that's not there. I bet you it's hidden underneath. Yep, it was hidden underneath. And as I said before, each subshell can hold two times two L plus one electrons. It's two L plus one, it's two L because we're going from negative two to two and so on. There's negative two, negative one, two, and one. The plus one to represent the zero and two because of the spin. Now, just to get really goddamn annoying, and I hate this fact, and I'm about to tell you this fact, and then I would never touch on it again. Everyone lettled the L shells. They also lettled the base shells, N equals 1, N equals 2, N equals 3, N equals 4, with capital letters, with K, L, M, N. I don't know what is after that. Um, I this, At this point, my mind explodes, and I'm like, fuck chemistry. Chemistry sucks, because literally we're becoming chemistry. I would never deal with these letters, because screw that noise. I was never a fan of chemistry. <laughs> And so we can say that at n equals 1, we have only an s shell. You can hold two electrons. When n equals 2, you have an s and a p shell for 2 and 6 to hold eight electrons. n equals 3, you have a p, d, and s. You can hold, uh, I'm offline. No, random order. Sorry, it's, I find that order with a 1, 2, 0. It's just, that's weird to me. So we're going to hold 6, 10, and 12, respectively, 18. Oh, that's because it's this one. I went off. Zero SPD. It went this way with SPD. And so on. And we would just view the notation as the, um, the shell number, the end state. Oh, sorry. And so this in general, this notation I was doing here, This is the notation for each individual electron. That's what I wanted. Except we're going to use a different notation, not talk about each individual electron, but to talk about the shells or the subshells. When we talk about the subshells, we're going to use a different notation. And what we're going to say is if you want to talk about any particular subshell, you will say the shell number, which is the n, also the principal quantum number, Followed by what type of sublevel, aka SPDF, you'll put that instead of the number, and then superscripted how many electrons are in it. This is commonly used in, when we start doing the chemistry involved here because most of the time the ML and the MS values have very little effect. The ML and MS of values only have an effect if you are in magnetic fields. And so we can say, if we have an S shell at the first energy level, we will write it like this. That if N equals 1 and L equals 0, it can hold two electrons. If L equals 0, that's S. So we write 1S2. If N equals full, if N equals full, you could have S, you could have P, or you could have D. Because you could have L equals 0 or 1 or 2. But let's just say we had one where where n equals full and SPD and n equals n equals two uh, zero one and n equals let me try again n equals full and L equals one. I could write that like this. Now I said before you put a superscript how many p can hold six electrons, but that doesn't necessarily mean how many it is. The number superscripted should be how many electrons happen to be in that one. So this right here would be n equals zero. Sorry, n equals full, p equals one, 
and there's three electrons in it. This doesn't tell you the four states. It doesn't tell you M of L, M of S. If I instead had something where N equals zero and L equals two that held seven electrons, it would be this. And each of these, you can say exactly what quantum states are allowed. Because we can use the other notation. And I'll say 1s2, that's two electrons. The 1, 0, 0, 1 half and the 1, 0, 0, negative 1 half. 4p3, 4p3 means n equals 4, p equals 1. That means I have six possible states. And these three electrons are three of these states. Ooh. One half, or they would be if I half, negative half, half, negative half, half, negative half, half, negative half, half. If I had written it correctly. 3D7, that means N equals 3, L equals 2. And then I can allow all these states. And so say it means seven electrons, it means seven of these are filled. Which seven? We're not exactly sure, although we will be in a second. We're covering that next. But that's where they go. Any questions? OK, let's get this done with this then. So you'd like to think. First energy level is lowest energy. Second energy level is the next energy. Third is three. And you'd like to think it goes up by L. L goes from zero, one, two, three, and so on. Here's the thing. Sometimes these subband splittings cause various energy levels to overlap. And when you go from lowest energy to highest energy, it's not necessarily counting. You'd think that it would go 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f, 5s, 5p, 5d, 5f. This would then be 5fg, and so on. But that's not the order electrons fill, because that's not actually the order from lowest energy to highest energy. That when these subbands split these energy levels, we find that they overlap. And the easiest way to keep track of the order from lowest energy to highest is to write them out like I showed here and draw arrows from the bottom right to the upper left. The order electrons fill shells will be start with 1s. And 1s will get, first electron will be 1s1, second electron will be at 1s2. Those are the electrons in 1s. Then it will go to 2s. First one will be 2s1, second one will be 2s2. Those are all the possibilities. Then we go to 2p. 2p can hold six electrons. I'm not going to bother listing everything on the bottom here just because it's going to get ugly. After 2p goes 3s, which can hold two electrons. After 3s goes 3p. And you would think after 3p would go 3d, but look at my arrow. And that's why we're going to do it this way. After 3p is 4s, because 4s is less energy than 3d. It goes 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p, 6s, and so on. Now, this is kind of weird, but it's just where the energy levels split. This going back to chemistry is the base of the octet rule and why we only care about eight, because we only have to fill an s shell and a p shell, because that's the outermost shell, because the d shell is always further in. And so what happens is that the order of filling is as like this. And you can use this to say exactly which orbitals are allowed in an element. Take ion, for example. Ion has an atomic number 26. We can say exactly which subbands are used in ion and its ground state. And an excited state, it could be anything. But it's ground state, we can say exactly which subbands are used. Because if ion has 26 electrons, we'll just add up 26 worth of subbands. And we'll say, OK, following this order, we start with 1s. 1s can hold 2. Then there's 2s. That also holds 2. Then 2p, that holds 6. Then 3s, that holds 2. Then 3p, that holds 6. And I'm just adding up these numbers. 4s, that holds 2. 
three D. Three D holds ten, but I only need it to add twenty six electrons. So I say three D six. Like how four S is a different font randomly. And I'll say three D six because it only needs six to hit twenty six. And say that is the structure of all the electrons in there. That the electrons are in the n equals one, l equals zero, also in the n equals two, l equals zero and one. I also say the n equals three, l equals zero, one, and two over here, and also in your n equals four, l equals zero. Now, when you look at this, whatever electrons are in the outermost band, in this case, it would be the two and four s two, whatever ones are in the one with the highest value of n, those are called valence electrons. That's the basis of all chemical reactions. Um, in 1871, someone first realized if you arrange the element according to the atomic mass, there were similarities. And then in 1912, a different person said, no, it's number of protons. That's the birth of the periodic table. And the periodic table was put in this weird ass shape. But with this understanding of the polyxusion principle, we see the reason for the periodic table is matching these quantum numbers. That the reason it's two, two wide over there, six wide over here, 10 wide in the middle, and 14 wide at the bottom, is that saying what is the outermost shell that's filled? This is just the order of shell filling. Going 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, and so on. I have a uh, a periodic table, um, like educational pull down board thing from like 1960. Okay. And it's actually like really cool. I mean, it's it's not laid out in the same way as that, but like it it's it's neat looking. I would say is the best way to put it. Okay, you have my curiosity, but yeah. Maybe I, I can send you like a picture of it. In yeah, email. send me a picture. <laughs> Now, if we're going to work out the full, what subshells are used on something, people don't normally list them out like I just did on ION. That's just annoying. Most of the time, people use what's called noble gas notation. Uh, the general idea is the elements on the far right side of the periodic table, they're known as noble gases. They have an outermost shell filled, they're unreactive. Uh, most of the time, when someone talks about the notation, they just say, the last noble gas and everything that happened since then. Um, what I mean is like, if you want to write the full configuration of cesium, which is atomic number 55, it's going to be a bitch. But you can instead say, okay, let's look at a periodic table for cesium. Here's cesium, cesium is number 55. The noble gas before cesium is xenon. That's the one right before it. So I can just say it's xenon plus XS1. For ion, which we did earlier, I would say the noble gas before ion is argon. So this is argon plus 4s2 plus 3d6. It's kind of easier than writing out the whole thing. But once again, my 4s is a different font. Now, pretty soon after the poly exclusion principle was worked out, a different man named Hund said, not only is the poly exclusion principle true, that we have all these subbands that have to be filled and we can't double up electrons, but Hund worked out exactly the order the subbands fill. Because take, for example, if I just have, if I just go up to n equals two, if I go up to n equals two, I can have electrons in the 1s, which is n equals 1, l equals 0, m of l equals 0. I can have things in 2s, n equals 2, l equals 0, m of l equals 0. And 2p, n equals 2, n equals 1, and three different values of ml. And he said each of these m of l values is called an orbital. I don't think I, I think I used the term before, but I don't think I said it. And each orbital is just saying where these electrons can lie. Well, each orbital can hold two electrons. And what he said is when you put 
electrons in the orbitals. The electrons will try to spread out as much as possible due to Coulomb interaction, like charges repelling. And everything will want to be spin up if possible. And they will spread out as many spin up as you can before a spin down goes in. And so, if you work through the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, work through the first 10 elements, you can say hydrogen has only one electron. That one electron will be in one, zero, zero, one half. Helium has two electrons. They will be respectively in one, zero, zero, one half and one, zero, zero, negative one half. Now I know that has to be spin down or else it would violate Pauli exclusion principle. Lithium has three electrons. Those three electrons will be one, zero, zero, one half, one, zero, zero, negative one half, and two, zero, zero, one half. If I need another electron for beryllium, it has to be spin down, Pauli exclusion. If I have five electrons, that's boron, the electron has to go to 2p. If I have six electrons, that's carbon, that electron cannot go in the same m of l equals negative one. That the electrons will spread out as much as possible. That's the basis of Hund's rule. That if the electron can spread out, it will. And they'll all go spin up and then go spin down. So if you have an electron in 2, 1, negative 1, 1 half, and you want to add another electron, it won't go to 2, 1, negative 1, negative 1 half. It'll go to 2, 1, 0, 1 half. Got another electron? Still wants to spread it out. Only when you start having all the spin up placed, then adding electrons, can they go spin down. And we can say exactly how each shell, subshell, and orbital get filled. But once again, shell is your N states, subshell is your L states, M of L is the orbitals. Okay? All right. So I'm going to do something really messy. Let's say I want to have the orbitals fill in uh, AS is arsenic, I think. A arsenic. Arsenic has atomic number 33. If I want to know how these bands fill, I would say they start at 1s. They're going to spin up and a spin down. And that's my quantum states for that. Then I'll go to 2s. Going to spin up and a spin down. Those are my states there. We're up to 4. I need to get up to 33. I'm at 4. I became track. Then we'll go to 2p. 2p, we'll put in the electrons all up, all down. Six states. That's 10. 3s, up, down. 3p. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. At this point, we're at uh, 10, 16, we're at 18. And I'm just following this math here. After 3p is 4s. Uh, 20. And these are all the place locations of all the electrons. I'm writing down the quantum numbers. After 4s is 3d. We're at 20, so we got to add all 10 to hit 30. We'll spread them out to those states. And then my spin downs. The slide sucked to make. So at 30 electrons, we only have three left. After 3D is 4P. One, two, three. And there you go. That on the bottom here, that is the, 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 the setup of the shells for arsenic. And to the upper right, that mass is all of the quantum numbers for all of the electrons in arsenic. Now, as I went out like this, you might be starting at the idea of why this becomes ugly and crappy when dealing with Schrodinger's equation for anything but hydrogen. Because you get a lot of atomic numbers that can do a lot of things. Now, for the record, no one would probably write it like this, though. If they wanted the stuff for arsenic, they would just say, you know what? Last one was argon. And instead, just say it's going to be argon plus 3s2 plus 3d10 plus op3. Now, the last bit of this, which I'll do in the last 10 minutes is that each of these subshells, 
each of these L states, your L equals zero, one, two, three, and so on, have a shape and size. And what I mean by that is once again, the Schrodinger equation predicts the area of probabilities of an electron. And what it was was when you solve the Schrodinger equation, it says where an electron probably is. When we first talked about it, I had this picture up. And I said the electron is somewhere in this pink cloud. But these suborbitals, when you solve this, will give the shape of where the probabilities are. Now, the higher value of n, it just makes a bigger area. That if n equals 1 for s, for n equals 1, s equals 0, or l equals 0, it's just going to be somewhere in a small circle. If n equals 2, a little bigger. n equals 3, bigger, and so on. And that's true for all of them. But the different subshells with self sorting equation say the locations of the electron become restricted into areas. Where if l equals 0, it's going to be somewhere within a sphere. If l equals 1, it's going to be somewhere within a dumbbell. You see what I mean in a second. And if l equals 2, it will be somewhere in this weird complex shape. What I mean is, here is my values of n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3 for l equals 0. They're all somewhere in this field. This is the area of probability. This isn't saying this is where the electron is. This is the area of probability where an electron can be. But let's look at just n equals 2, l equals 1. If n equals 2, l equals 1, there's three different orbitals. There's ml equals negative 1, ml equals 0, ml equals 1. And each has a set shape. If n equals 2, l equals 1, ml equals negative 1, it's either somewhere over here on the x-axis or somewhere over here on the x-axis and nowhere else. If n equals 2, l equals 1, ml equals 0, it's somewhere over here on the y-axis or somewhere over here on the y-axis or nowhere else. And likewise, when m of l equals 1 on the z. And so the entire L equals 1 is this weird shape where this shows where the electrons could be. But they're not orbiting in a nice circle like Bohr said. They're somewhere matching this shape. And this is kind of where the old Bohr model goes really out the window. Because, yeah, it's not orbiting. It's somewhere like this. Um, now, to explain this dumbbell shape, a uh, chemistry book I used to use gave this example, and it's so goddamn dumb I like to share it, which is for this dumbbell shape, what they're saying is it's either on this side or it's on this side. It's never in the middle. And the example they gave was a fly in an hourglass that it can get through the middle, but the chance of it being in the middle is very slim. That's probably over here or over there. Once again, it's so stupid, I just use it anyways. <laughs> It kind of looks like the uh, old Windows XP screensaver where it has like that colorful cube that kind of morphs into oh, like yeah, a yeah. Yep. shapes. I know what you mean. Yep. Yeah. Now, the D orbital is X's. And the D orbital, since, oops, there was a small typo here. The, the D orbital, which is L equals 2, despite what was written there, can have three. Five different values of MML, negative L, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And each one of those, well, four of them make a weird X shape along various axes. And the last one looks like a weird pacifier. But what it says is if an electron is in L equals 2, M of L equals anything, it'll be in this area. This is the area of probability where it should show up. For everything else, the shapes get complicated. I'm not going to show this video because I want to do something with the last little bit of class. Um, but for everything else, the shapes get complicated. Now, those shapes are predicted by the Schrodinger equation mathematically, just for hydrogen at higher energy levels. But here's the thing. They've been proven. People looked at hydrogen atom with excited electrons, and they excited the electrons to a different spot and looked at the heat map of the density of where the electrons were. And they found it matched. That things in the S shell, we saw circles. Things in the P shell, we saw a splitting. Things in the D shell, we saw the X. And it works. Now, to go any further with this, any further of this isn't physics anymore. This is also officially, this was atomic physics. This is the physics of an atom. But any further isn't physics anymore. This is now chemistry. This is the basis of all chemistry which is a pretty good place to stop because I'm not teaching you chemistry.
but that's the idea. Are you sure I'll allow it? <laughs> that I'll teach you chemistry? You don't want me teaching you chemistry. That's all right. I don't want any more chemistry in my life. <laughs> I, I used to teach chemistry at SUNY Delhi, but it wasn't a great idea. I last took chemistry in high school. I placed out of it in college. <laughs> okay. I got five minutes left. Any questions on this before I talk about the final again for a little bit? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, where'd it go? Are we still doing practice problems on Friday? Yep, we're still doing practice problems on Friday. Okay, I've opened this PDF before in class. Uh, I'm just gonna do uh, the first bit of it really quick because I did it before, but I wanna cover the last little bit. Um, so Friday will still be practice problems. Thursday, I have that optional review at one o'clock. Um, general idea, once again, your final is on the 14th at 5.30. It's really 5.30 to 7.30, but I'm giving you an extra 15 minutes to upload it. You have to do questions one through four. You do four out of five through nine. You need to tell me which one you skip. Um, it does weird things for Vanco Hall grading, which I've been meaning to do that. Um, it does weird things with Vanco Hall grading, which is a pain. Um, okay, yep, I did do that. That is fixed. But don't worry, I will take care of that. Don't forget you have a homework due on Sunday. Never mind one due tonight. And once again, here is the setup. Your first problem will be the wave nature of light. It'll either be single slit diffraction, double slit diffraction, thin films, or polarization, or a combination. The second problem will be relativity. It'll either be length Near at relativistic speeds, or time at relativistic speeds, or vector addition at relativistic speed, or a combination. The third problem will be from chapter 30. It will either be photoelectric effect, or x-rays, or Compton scattering, or de Broglie wavelength, or a combination. The fourth problem will either be about the Bohr model, or the Weidberg equation, or the quantum states in the Schrodinger equation I've been doing. I obviously can't have you solve the Schrodinger equation, so I'll just be dealing with these quantum states. The remaining five. Five will be something with point charges, and you gotta deal with it. Either point charges electric fields, or point charges with force, or point charge with potential energy, or point charge with voltage, or a combination. The sixth problem will be a Kirchhoff loop because I hate everyone. The seventh problem will be magnetic fields, which could be force in a magnetic field, aka uh, QVB sine theta or ILB sine theta, the magnetic fields from a while and induced magnetic fields. The eighth problem will involve AC circuits, probably impedance, phase angle, and that jazz. And the last problem is traditionally the easiest one is lenses and mirrors. So one over Q plus one over P equals one over F. I always recommend making an equation sheet, even though it's open notes since we're online. Um, the process of making an equation sheet is a good way to study. Plus you don't wanna have all the notes open during the exam, it just wastes time but I always did this in physics one, so I'm gonna do this in physics two. Here's the rundown. So doing that again, forces in electric fields. I'm gonna do this fast because I only have a minute, but I, this is posted online. Potential energy due to charged. And ele potential energy and electric potential. Capacitors, resistors, circuits in parallel, circuits in series and magnets. Now tied in the magnets could also be induced, induced magnetic fields, which isn't there. If you need induced magnetic fields, there you go. There was also inductors. There was AC circuitry, reflection and refraction, lenses and mirrors. And the new stuff 
double slit, thin film, single slit, diffraction gratings, polarization. From chapter 29, here's all relativity, plus the kinetic energy stuff. From chapter 30, photoelectric effect, and the other stuff in there. And from 31, all the equations in 31 was the stuff from Bohr model. But you should also know your quantum states. That's the breakdown. OK? All right. OK, so I'll stop there. That is the last lecture you're going to really hear. We do have practice problems on Friday. But that's the last of these PowerPoints. So um, congrats on making through it. I'll talk to you all later.